All right, so I watched this debate. Kenny Rhodes versus Matt Dillahunty to show down modern day debates. Um, I got to tell you guys, I got to tell you, you know, Matt, this is the second time I have seen him in a public debate where he hasn't looked all that good. <laughs> <laughs> where Matt is going to have to bring a little bit more to the table. Uh, despite the protests to the contrary, if you go look at the comment section, all of his, his, his little followers and sicko fans insist that he shut the guy down. No, there was a long period in there for at least 45 minutes where he struggled unnecessarily to admit to the obvious. There was a 45-minute piece in that debate where Matt Dillahunty was basically saying there's no such char characteristic as the essence. Okay, that's not acceptable. Yes, there is. Philosophy 101. So he was saying, define essence. Okay, pretty easy. I didn't look this up, guys. <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't Google this. <laughs> pretty easy to define. I defined it off the top of my head. The essence of something is that which truly rep that which is the most true definition of it and transcends the sum of its contingent parts. Is that a good way of saying it? The essence of something is that which most true, truly defines it and transcends the sum of, it, of its contingent parts. Bang! Just like that, Philosophy 101. Matt should know that. And if he didn't know that, he should have signed off out of the debate and said, I agree, let's move on. Why he didn't, I don't know. I've seen him do this one other time before in the debate with Dr. Howard Resnick, where, you know, he started doing the same exact thing. Spent 45 minutes telling, to, arguing to Howard Resnick, basically arguing against reality itself. There is no such thing as Sataniness. There's no such characteristic. Yeah, there is. Look it up in the dictionary. Just because both of these terms are subjective, that's the thing that was throwing him a little, but that's no, that's no excuse. There is such a thing as the essence of something. Now, they were, I guess, the, the essence of a pen, that's a dumb question. Why? Because there isn't really such a thing as the essence of a pen. The right answer is it's penness. It's pen-like qualities. Yeah, it sounds sophistry because it's a dumb question. A pen doesn't really have an, an essence per se. It writes. That's its essence. It's utilitarian. The essence of a pen is functional nature and utilitarian. It writes things. <laughs> it doesn't really have an essence. It's more in the, in the categories of aesthetics or religion. So you can ask, for example, what is the essence of being an American? Why is it hard to define? Because it's totally subjective. Is it not? Ask again. Is there an essence to being an American? Of course there is. You bet your sweet mom apple pie, flag-waving Yahoo there is. You bet your pickup truck there is. You bet your sweet pickup truck there is. Hallelujah. Yeah, there certainly is. Now, what is the essence of being American? Depends on who you ask. You ask Mr. Guns and Ammo and he'll tell you straight up. Yeah, there is. God, guns, and, go God, guns, and no government off our back. Hallelujah. <laughs> That's what he'll tell you, the, you know. Patriots, flag waving. I don't know. Shoot him up. <laughs> go, go shoot people. <laughs> Unabombers. No, he's not a Unabomber. He's not a Unabomber. That's a that's a mischaracterization. You ask a certain type of person what's the essence of being American. My nephew is a, is a Marine. Ask him what the essence of being American is. You'll get a different answer than if you ask. His mother, who's a hippie, who's like a, you know, she's a really smart person, but she's like Harvard-educated, kind of like Birkenstock-wearing hippie. She might answer the essence of being American is freedom. By the time we got to Woodstock, we will have, you know, she might answer to something totally different. Both of them would be correct. Why? Because it's subjective. Yeah, it's funny. She's a, she's a hippie. They're a really smart couple. My, my, my brother-in-law is a producer, a fairly famous producer. It was like a, um, a kind of indie punk label out of Boston. And their son is like Mr. Mr. Marine. Really cool kid, really sharp kid. But he went the opposite way of them on purpose. He's like, you know, he's in Japan right now, rifle training or something like that. Um... And he's like Mr. Red State, born and bred. 
him and my wife get along really well. <laughs> I should say they talk about that sort of stuff. There's an essence of being American. Depends on who you ask. Depends on who you ask. But that doesn't. The thing that Matt Dillon was arguing is that there's no such thing as the essence of something. Okay, that's just ridiculous. Philosophy 101. It's the same mistake he made when he was debating Howard Resnick. There's a difference between winning something by the logic and the quality of your argumentation, the quality of your argumentation alone, and by winning something by not acknowledging the obvious. Usually Matt Dillahunty doesn't do that. In these two cases, he did do it. And that's going to be potentially problematic for him in the months and weeks to come. Why? Because he's showing signs of, you know, he's the best debater in the atheist community. And I've said this before, and I will say this again. This is worth repeating to the point we actually memorize it. There's Bernardo Castro, who I've talked about, who's been spoiling for a fight to debate Sam Harris. If Sam Harris debates him, it will be a blowout. There is no way Sam Harris will put... Sam Harris will be able to put seven points on the board against him. That's about it. Matt Dillahunty would not, cannot debate Bernardo Castro at all. He wouldn't be able to put a single point on the board against him. Now, had he chosen a different route, that might be different. Why? He's got a lot of innate intelligence. He's borderline brilliant. That's why he's so good at debating. Because he's, and just a word about the Dillahunty Dodge. The Dillahunty Dodge is appropriate in certain contexts. If this, it depends on what you're debating. If the structure of the debate is such that the Christian says, here's this contingency argument, here's this argument, Kalam argument, and this proves God, it is not, Matt Dillahunty doesn't have to come up with the better argument. <laughs> That's what he ever keeps saying to him. He doesn't have to prove not God. He just has to maneuver away, he just has to maneuver out of your proof of God. Why? Because ostensibly it's a proof of God. If he can maneuver out of it, it didn't prove God. You've got to go back to the drawing board and reconfigure. Why? Because it didn't prove God. If the argument is structured properly, it should be a proof of God. He cannot... So Matt Dillahunty, when, he, when people accuse him of doing the Dillahunty dodge, is perfectly appropriate in the context of a proof of God debate. He's maneuvering out of something. If he can maneuver out of it, it didn't prove. Period. End of discussion. Why? Because he maneuvered out of it. Doesn't, you, can, you can object to his maneuverings, but the fact that there are meaningful objections to be had to your, your structured argument means it did not prove. Period. Think of the paradigmatic syllogism. Socrates is a man. Can he maneuver out of that? No. All men are mortal. Can he maneuver out of that? No. Ergo, you know, what is it? Socrates is, <laughs> Socrates is mortal too. Some of these. Did I say that right? I, I forget if I said that right. Doesn't matter. You understand the point. There's no maneuvering out of that. Ergo, it is a proof. If you are offering a proof of God, then it has to prove God. He, he will not be able to maneuver without sacrificing his intellectual integrity. And no, the only two times I've seen him sacrifice his intellectual integrity in public in a structured debate like this is this, is this last Saturday night where he tried to pretend that there's no such thing as a quality of essence when in fact it's philosophy 101. He should have known that or he should have readily assented to it. The reason why it's hard to define is because it's purely subjective, as I already said. It's hard to define. And there's no such thing as the essence to a pen necessarily. So that was kind of a dumb little game. He did the same thing with when he was debating Dr. Howard Resnick. Same idea. There's no such quality as saying Dr. Redneck off uh, Resnick, Dr. Redneck. <laughs> Dr. Redneck, yeah, he's got God and ammo too, except he's a Hindu version. I don't know, he's a redneck Hindu. It's really weird. <laughs> yeah, I swear to God he is. He's a redneck. He's just like a he's just like a pick drives a pickup truck. Except the Hindu version of that. So he drives like a uh, who's the who's the Hindu guy? There's some sort of car in India that was like a nano, I think it was called, and it's like I forget, I forget the details. But there was some, there's some sort of billionaire guy in India who was making tiny little cars that were selling for like three thousand bucks. I was going to say that's that's the that's the Hindu equivalent of the red pickup truck. Um, so there's some guy in, so Dr. Howard Resnick and him, same idea. There was 45 minute interval in the debate where the debate just turned into a gobbledygook because Matt Dillahunty refused to yield the ground that he should have yielded. Why? Because it was obviously true. 
And he was insisting up and down that there's no such thing as a quality of saintliness. Yeah, there is. You can look it up. It's somewhat subjective, but it ain't that subjective. And Resnick's argument was that was proof of concept for his Hindu, his Hare Krishna school of philosophy or religion, whatever you want to call it. That if people take his training and they practice his rituals for a series of years, they will become more saintly. Okay, that's just something you should agree to. Period. Why? Because that's a pro almost a provable fact. And then go look at the evidence. Do these, do these fruits seem more saintly? Matt Dillon, he was trying to argue the basically a totally ludicrous premise. There's no such quality as saintliness. Yeah, of course there is. You can look it up in the dictionary. Are they patient? Are they kind? Are they long-suffering? Are they willing to suffer wrong? Okay, then they're more saintly than your average Tom, Dick, or Harry. It's that simple. There's a quality and there's criteria associated with, with, there's a readily available set of criteria that we would, any normal reasonable person would associate with saintliness and it could be applied to these, these followers of him and we could empirically investigate, are these guys more saintly than your average Tom, Dick, or Harry? Pretty easy, pretty straightforward. Matt Dillon should have yielded the ground. Maybe the reason why he's starting to not yield the ground is he recognizes that he's getting a little too close to the Sky Ferry for comfort. As I've already said, some of these arguments are better than you think, guys. Some of these arguments are better than you think, guys. Dry Apologist is doing it right. Perhaps Christian Idealism is doing it right, too. Mix and match. Go back to the tinker closet and tinker around a little bit. To think of these arguments as your tinker toys. They don't necessarily work as framed. Be creative. Be innovative. Matt Dillahunty, as I pointed out, has already publicly agreed in two debates with the precepts to these facts, readily available of facts of the matter. He has agreed to 70% of the existence of a Sky Ferry. I swear to God that's true. Go look at the debates. He agreed in public to these facts. There's such a thing as the law of logic exists. Fact. The laws of logic are transcendent in nature. Fact. How do you know that, Craig? If you are reading a book by Immanuel Kant, okay, that, that information is available to you today, but it is transcendent in nature, which means it is not time-dependent or time-contingent. It is as if you went back 200 years and were reading it then. Why? The information has transcended its source. So it is not time-dependent. That's Fact. If you don't understand that fact, Brenda, <laughs> I can't believe you said something that gobbledygook. I got you this time, Greg. If you don't understand that fact, Brenda, <laughs> I swear to God, she's gonna be. She's a good chance that she's gonna show up in the comment on the Twitter feed, going, "I can't believe he said this," because she didn't understand the fact. That's a fact, guys. I'll debate any bro. I'll debate me bro about that with anybody in town, and you'll lose the debate. Why? That's a fact. And Matt Dillahunty is the, is the reigning king, philosopher king of the atheist community. He already agreed to that publicly. It's a fact. So laws of logic are, A, transcendent in nature. Immaterial. That's the one that was, oh, immaterial, oh my God, here it goes. Here it goes with supernatural. I said immaterial, not supernatural. Big difference. Listen. I said, listen. <laughs> listen. I said immaterial, not supernatural. If you've been paying attention to the way I've been doing this, I am processing all the metaphysical excrement, so to speak, <laughs> out of the arguments. Why? They are unnecessary. They are baggage. We don't need to prove metaphysical abstractions that cannot be proved. Stick to the facts. These are the readily available facts that are available to the pre-sup, and Matt Dillahunt agreed to them all publicly, and they're all facts. No, they don't prove a sky fairy, but they 75% of the way there. Fact, the laws of logic are immaterial. Immaterial in this context means only they cannot be heated up. They cannot be measured. They have no material representation whatsoever. So if I go back in time, it is as if I have traveled back in time, read a book by Immanuel Kant, picked up his phenomena noumena distinction. I am talking about it in the present day. Okay, those are ideas. They can't be empirically investigated for why they have no material representation whatsoever. They are mental abstractions. That doesn't mean they aren't true. So Matt Dillahunty has readily agreed to all of that in public. I promise. That's pretty darn close to a Sky Ferry right there. 
It's not close enough, Craig. <laughs> okay, well then use a little faith and put yourself over the finish line. Have faith. Get yourself over the finish line. Faith in that. Ah, faith. I'm going to fall apart. My head's going to explode. I can't believe you said faith. <laughs> have a little faith. Get over the finish line. Because you've got to have faith. Uh, I gotta have faith. I don't even remember how that song goes. Is it George Michael? <laughs> faith, the faith, the faith, the just have some faith, the faith, the faith, the baby. <laughs> all right, all right. I'm starting to sing George Michael. Maybe I'm making. Maybe the video's gone on a little too long. I'm starting to sing George Michael videos. Um, no, the law of logic. Oh, the other thing about a law of logic. What? It's a law. Law. It is inviolate. Key. So Matt Dillahunty readily agreed to all those things. The only one that is potentially assailable is... Uh, um, I guess people could argue that it isn't inviolate, but they will, they will lose that debate. Why? Because it is inviolate. Law of logic. That is how it is used as a rule of inference. Why? It cannot be violated. It can be violated, but it cannot be violated and you have cogent sense. If you violate it, it's illogical. It is a rule of inference, a law. Breaking rocks in the hot sun. I fought the law in the law one. Can't fight the law of logic. <laughs> I left my... <laughs> Sounds pretty good. Did you like that? Can't fight the law of logic. Can't fight the law of logic. Left my baby in it. Feels so bad, I guess my race is run. Sweetest little woman that I ever had. Can't fight the law of logic. Why it's a law, it's inviolate. Can't fight the law of logic. Why it's a law, it's inviolate. <laughs> that was pretty good. Big up right on the spot. Once upon a time, long ago, I was an improv troupe in New York, New York. It was really fun. It was really fun. I was one of the better people in the group. I was not the best person in the group, not the best case scenario. The best kid in the group was freaking off the charts. Don't know what happened to the guy. He was like, I don't know. I don't remember what happened to him, but man, was that kid. That kid was like explosively talented. He was from another planet. He was so brilliant. I was good. I was good. I was okay. I was, I was shock jock. <laughs> that, that, that was my talent. Saying the outrageous and inappropriate thing and timing it well enough that everyone would go, Oh my God, I can't believe somebody said that. I was like, yeah, that's, that's, where, I, that's where my head was at. I was basically South Park. <laughs> that's, and I still am to some degrees. Me and my friend from uh, Pasadena often get together and play South Park. Who can say the most outlandish and shocking and inappropriate thing? And I usually win because I say really weird, shocking and inappropriate things. My wife calls us Dumb and Dumber. <laughs> I swear to God. I swear to God, that's her day for us. I swear to God, that's what she's... The other day he was going to come down, and then I forget, he was going to come down on uh, Memorial Day, I think it was, because he was going to come use the beach. And we, you know, we live on the beach, so he wanted to come and hang out on the beach with his wife. And she's... My wife was like, so what time is your friend coming? Dumb and Dumber. <laughs> <laughs> you and your friend, you know, which one's dumb and which one's dumber? I don't know, she had this whole routine that she was like, yeah, she was per persecuting me. Yeah, uh, picking on me, exactly. <laughs> Sounds like she was picking on you, Greg. Yes, exactly. Now you see my side of the story. Understand that. All right, all right, so let's write it down. Um, did we all learn something? No. <laughs> um, um, uh, I mean, I guess there's more to say. I guess I'll go over the Dill Hunter debate. Uh, it's not really that important. It's not worth it. The only thing to know is that Matt Dillahunty is vincible. Vincible. If you used to think, oh my God, that guy's invincible. No, he ain't. He's vincible. He's very beatable. <laughs> he's been debating, you know, he's been picking up bad habits on the atheist experience. You know, having these wreck me bro debates against people he shouldn't even be bothered debating. If somebody calls up and they're not like, you know, they're not intelligent enough to debate, he'll still go through the motions and debate me, bro, them and shut them down and wreck them. And I guess that's what the audience wants to see. But that's a little bit dumb. And it makes you dumber to do it. It takes what Shannon does when someone is like that is she'll try to, you know, turn it into a real conversation. OK, that takes some skill. That's not dumbing it down. It's kind of like elevating the dialogue. It's what she used to say. That's what she used to be about. I think she's still about that to some degree. Don't get corrupted, Shannon. Don't become like the atheist experience. 
Why? Because they're, it's not going to keep working. That show got old a long time ago. I watch it just to take notes, <laughs> observe. But that show got old a long time ago. The new way is the Dan way, the objectively Dan, truth wanted way. That's, that's the way that will that we'll keep going. The wreck me bro debate thing, it's not going to work anymore. I've already explained this in other videos. I'll explain in detail in videos to come. It's not worth getting into right now. There are two types of atheists. There's more than two types, but there's the philosophical atheist and the top shelf atheist. Shannon is a top shelf atheist, okay? Shannon is one of the few people in the atheist community, actually objectively Dan can, who will ask a clarifying question, and it's a clarifying question. Matt Dillahunty will say it's a clarifying question, and it ain't. <laughs> He's trying to wreck the person, trying to throw them off their game so they can't present an argument. That's not good. It didn't help. It didn't serve him to do that. Why? Because it made him weaker. Once upon a time, that guy could have been a really, really, really good debater. But he wasted his time debating people he shouldn't have been debating. He should have been like, you know, I, I swear to God, this is true, guys. I stand by this. If, if God help him if this ever happens in real life. But if Bernardo Castro should ever be so inclined as to debate Matt Dillahunt, he won't even be close. Matt Dillahunty will not be able to score a point against him. Neither will Sam Harris. Sam Harris will do a little better than Matt Dillahunty, but still will not be able to score a point against Bernardo Castro. Why? It's a different league altogether. In terms of, you know, in terms of the, what's it called? The, what, what, what's the word I'm looking for? In terms of egghead, <laughs> egghead superiority complexes? No. In terms of, you know, um, who, who is the most... Be spectacled egghead from on high. Who is the highest of the high in terms of the brainiest brain power and the quality of the argumentation? Bernardo Castro is an entirely different league than Sam Harris and Matt Dillahunty. And if ever, either of them were to debate him, it would show immediately. It would be revolutionary in its impact. Why? Because what was revolutionary? A lot of these guys think Christians are dumb. Bernardo Castro is not dumb at all. He's not a Christian either, though. Um, that's, uh, that's what I meant. He's not a Christian. But when going, I've said this before in another video, it's worth, it's worth re-examining, rethinking about just for a second. When um, Jordan Peterson debated Sam Harris, there was a series of three debates in Toronto, I think it was, or England, I forget which one. But there was a series of about three debates. That, had, that revolutionized the apologetics community to some degree. It energized a lot of people, and to some degree, it started a fire that is still with us. Okay? Why? Because he easily held his own against Sam Harris. I would say he won that debate, but even if he didn't win the debate, he easily held his ground. There was no arguing that Sam Harris crushed him or any of that. So to see someone who is on Team Christian, even though he's technically not a Christian, now he's becoming somewhat of a Christian, hold their own like that in a public debate on intellectual territory, revolutionized things. It did. Now, Bernardo Castro is not a Christian. He's not a theist. He's an atheist. But the stuff that he is saying and, and his, metaphysical, his metaphysical idealism postulate is well thought out. It is unassailable. Matt Dillahunty will not be able to do anything against it. It has some stuff that needs to be ironed out. But in terms of its intellectual structure, remember what I said way back when. The structure of the debate, 99 times out of 100, the structure of the argument is what will carry the day. Why? It's really hard to lose if you have a properly structured argument. Really hard to lose. If you're building it off the facts and just the facts alone, it is basically becomes unassailable, and I mean that in the best case scenario, best sense of the term. There's no way Matt Dillahunty will be able to score a point against his metaphysical ideals and possibly. No way. Zero. He won't put a single point on the board. He shouldn't try to. He should just, you know, <laughs> let go and let go. <laughs> okay, this is way more intelligent than anything I've been dealing with for the past 10 years. Let me now re-examine the facts and start getting with this. Why? Because it's smarter than what I've been doing. Yeah, <laughs> he shouldn't have to. He shouldn't have to even try. He should just be already, you know, checking it out and going, wait a minute, this is a lot more intelligent than what I've been doing. He's the top gun in the atheist community. Okay, he's way outclassed by somebody even top or gun. Not a Christian, not a theist, but it's theist-friendly territory, his ideas. And then above him is the guy I keep mentioning, Roberto Covelli, who is the preeminent physicist alive today. He's possibly the greatest physicist 
could be since Einstein, really, honestly. I really think he's that good. I really do think he's that good. I really do. But he is also possibly the greatest philosopher alive today. And the cool thing about him is that he's easy to understand. He's human. He's like us. He talks like us. He eats like us. You can understand the lectures that he presents that are more geared towards popular understanding. You can understand. So... Uh, yeah, a bit rambly, but, you know, it was cool, it was a fun video, we had a good time, everyone stop complaining. We had a good time, stop complaining. You know, I like to ramble, get off topic, <laughs> talk, talk about this, sing a class song, you know, it's a great video, it's a great read video, what do you want? <laughs> it's all over the place, Greg, yeah, well, that's part of the fun. <laughs> you know, relax, enjoy the ride. Relax and enjoy the ride, let go and let God, as they say in Christianity, let go and let God. Turn off your mind, relax and float downstream. It is not dying. It is not dying. <laughs> no, it didn't work. All right. Doesn't always work. It doesn't always work, right? Yeah, okay, fine, whatever. Anyways, this is just a little throwaway video. It's not that important of a debate. This is just a little thing I threw off, off the cuff, over the shoulder. So this might not even make it to post. <laughs> I might not even post this. Uh, we'll see. I'll listen to it again, and I probably will. So, there you have it, kids. That was today's insights into the workings of Twitter, YouTube, atheist debates, all sorts of different stuff. That is all for now. The Mass has ended. Go in peace. Amen.